This module will feature the close-up dry cow, or what we call a phase two feeding program. This is the, quote, new dry cow program that has been around now for several years, but has really helped a number of dairy farmers, veterinarians, nutritionists, consultants, really get higher milk production out of these uh, genetically superior cows. So with that bit of an intro, we're ready to start this module on phase two cows. Phase two is what we will call the close-up dry cow program. Uh, it is the last three weeks prior to calving when some very important things are happening. So it is our second phase that follows our far-off dry cows and just takes our cow right up to the calving window. Iowa researchers have suggested that there are some very important physiological changes and goals that need to be accomplished during this last three weeks, and they are included on your screen. First, we have to adapt the rumen, simply meaning we will stimulate the rumen papillae, increasing their length, will increase the absorption of volatile fatty acids and other nutrients, along with adapting the rumen microbes. We will, number two, try to maintain blood calcium, very important for such things as calf delivery, for cleaning, and other biological functions. Thirdly, we will want to build and hopefully, or should say maintain, hopefully already have built it, the immune system from the far-off dry cow program to help this cow go through this tremendous stress at calving. And fourthly, try to maintain a positive energy balance in the last week especially before calving. Certainly a number of factors we need to discuss before we get into the actual nutrient guidelines. One will be a rather large word you can write down if you want to use it on Scrabble is called clostrogenesis. Uh, this is a very technical name for clostrum synthesis by the close-up dry cow. This requires about 15 days when it starts to initiate based on some Ohio and Illinois research. This is hormonally controlled. You cannot speed this up. Therefore, if a cow calves a bit early, that is why you usually have low levels of poor quality clostrum in the cow's mammary system. Other factors that will affect quality besides early calving, not getting the full 15 days of stimulation, would be leakage. If the cow leaks the colostrum, obviously we lose this high quality product. We know age of the cow, work done by Bruce Larson here at Illinois, shows that older cows produce a higher quality with a broader spectrum antibody in it than does first calf animals. And we know from our veterinarian colleagues that if we immunize this cow, we can stimulate certain antibodies in the colostrum, which the calf can absorb at the time she's fed colostrum in the first feeding. Another area of concern will be utter edema. This is the swelling that occurs in the mammary system, can appear in the belly of the heifer, extend all the way to the front legs if it's severe enough. And certainly there are some nutritional things and some management things to be aware of utter edema. The big concern, of course, the udder gets extremely tight. We can cause damage to the medial suspensory ligament and certainly cause some damage to the support structure, causing this animal to be called a bit early. In terms of nutrition, the work in Kentucky pretty well shows that higher levels of sodium and potassium Potassium can actually change the fluidity or the edema in the close-up dry cow. And of course, this is very similar to humans as well. So reviewing mineral intake will be important. Uh, grain intake is a bit controversial. There are some studies from Minnesota and Michigan saying that it is implicated in utter edema. So we may not want to go to real high grain intakes, although there's other studies saying there's no direct tie to it. Indiana data is very clear that older heifers do have more edema than younger heifers. Hopefully, we don't have old heifers anyway but certainly they are more prone to utter edema. We know that anionic salts should not be causing utter edema. This is a bit controversial. The research says no. Farmers in the field say yes, so certainly anionic salts could be potential risk. And finally, if you do have utter edema, the data from Cornell pretty clearly shows that we should be pre of milking these animals. Literally start getting the blood flow through the mammary system to move those fluids out. And you can start pre milking as soon as there is milk there. Be well aware, of course, your colostrum quality is very poor, and you'll have to have some frozen or stored colostrum for that new calf. A third area of concern would be metabolic disorders and expenses. Uh, this slide, uh, brand new data from New York, Cornell, Veterinary College, says what does metabolic expenses are involved with these disorders? A milk fever, $334 for a clinical case of milk fever. Uh, this list includes not only treatment costs, but lost milk production, extra labor involved, and in some cases, culling, increased culling pressure due to the metabolic disorder. These are very expensive costs. DA 
$340. We'll break that down in the next visual. Retain placenta, $285. Ketosis, $145. Take home message, we want to minimize metabolic disorders because they are very expensive and we'll start this cow out on a very poor lactation curve. This summary work from Wisconsin illustrates the cost of a DA and some of the other associated risks. About 1,228 pounds of milk is what you will tend to lose with a case on average of a displaced ablamasin that is treated by your veterinarian. You'll see that the loss on heifers is less than older cows in terms of milk yield, 800 pounds versus 1,540 pounds. Probably heifers are a bit more resilient and also are a bit more persistent, so they don't lose quite as much milk in the lactation curve. Here's the scary part. You'll see other risks associated with a DA, uh, about a seven times greater risk of an RP or retained placenta. And in some cases, if you have retained placenta, you will lead to DA. So these can go back and forth and about a 12 times greater risk of ketosis. So these other metabolic disorders are associated with displaced ablamasin. So you see, it gets to be almost like a snowball effect. They just start and rolls into other problems. And pretty soon, this fresh cow is just hammered coming out of the dry cow period. Another factor will be negative energy balance, especially close to calving. Uh, why do cows go in negative energy balance in this last two or three weeks? Well, we know, first of all, the unborn calf is very rapidly growing in tissue and growth. In fact, if you don't believe that, look at your cows that calve 8 or 10 days late. Generally, we'll have a fairly large calf. Second of all, the Wisconsin data has clearly illustrated that cows eat less dry matter the last three or four days before calving. So here we have a cow that's got a greater nutrient demand because of colostrum synthesis. We have a calf that's rapidly growing. As this slide points out, we may have two calves in that cow growing, and here she is eating less dry matter. We call that burning both ends of the candle, and the problem is our cow gets herself caught in in a very large negative energy balance. So here are the challenges that farmers, nutritionists, veterinarians face. Let's look at some goals then we want to try to manipulate. Goals for the close-up dry cows, you can embellish this list and make it longer, but to me these are four awfully important goals that we want to try to control. Number one, metabolic disorder, and I will pick two of them specifically. Try to maintain blood calcium levels above the 8 milligram percent range because effects it has on uterine health and muscle tone, and try to control the amount of NEFAs, non-esterified fatty acids, which we will discuss a bit later. We also want want to shift the rumen, as we mentioned earlier, both the rumen papillae and the rumen microbes, build the immune system, which we commented on earlier because of the challenge of mastitis, diseases, and metabolic disorders, and finally try to maintain and build dry matter intake rather than lose it. Again, we have guidelines that we are recommending. Dry matter intake, we would expect would be 22 pounds of dry matter, especially in that last week prior to calving. If you can beat this number, if you can keep cows up at that magic 28, hallelujah, that is good news. But generally expect this number to drop. Because the number drops, we are going to build the protein levels up, so we are delivering at least equal to, if not more, amino acids or crude protein to this cow. So we're up in that 15 to 16% protein level. You'll notice now that we are going to more bypass protein. The proportion of undegradable intake protein, or called UIP, has now been raised from 30% to 40% in the close-up dry cow ration, and that's because the cow eats less dry matter. The rumen microbes produce less microbial protein. So if I'm going to try to get more amino acids for colostrum synthesis and for calf growth, I've got to deliver those amino acids preformed. And of course, since the DIP has dropped down to 60, the SIP, or soluble intake protein, drops down in that 30% percent range. Energetically, again, a much more aggressive increase in energy compared to the far-off dry cow programs. We're looking around a 67, 68 TDN, a net energy around 0.7. So you can see it's kind of intermediate between the far-off dry cow and the fresh cow program. We are adding some fat here to try to get some extra energy to these cows. We have some Illinois data showing some benefit with modest amounts of fat to these cows at this stage of the gestation cycle. The ADF and NDFs are dropping because I have to build an energy energy richer diets requiring more starch and less bulky fiber and our NFCs non-fiber carbohydrates increasing up to 33-34%. So we have energetically increased the density of this cow to accumulate both the nutrient and the rumen stimulation we mentioned earlier. 
The mineral one gets much more complex because now we have choices. We will be discussing the anionic salt diets a bit later in another module, but depending on which program you are, you can see some real differences. We've increased the calcium and phosphorus slightly from the far off dry cow program because of the decrease in dry matter intake. You'll notice if we go to anionic salts, the calcium nearly doubles because of the effects of the anionic salts. Uh, the magnesium level, you can see, also is up slightly from where it was in the far-off dry cow program. In fact, some people suggest our close-up cows become low in blood magnesium, and some of the reasons why we have problems with these cows in the transition period. Again, in the close-up rations with anionic salts, that number nearly doubles. Potassium stays very, very low at 0.65. Again, very difficult to achieve with the feedstuffs and forages many of us have on farms. The sodium level is reduced, as is the chlorine level to try to minimize utter edema. A number of nutritionists, including ourselves, do not recommend any salt in the last part of the close-up dry cow program to minimize utter edema and allow the cow to recycle those minerals herself. If you are in the anionic salt, so you'll see the chlorine level goes up very, very high because that is one of our major drivers for anionics changes in the DCAD part of the equation. And the sulfur levels, again, a 0.2, just a modest increase for the dry matter drop in a traditional close-up dry cow program, but a doubling if you're going to go to the anionic salts. So be very careful you understand which program you're on because the macro mineral levels really changes depending on the program and protocol you are following. On the vitamin levels, again, a fairly good vitamin level. Unlike, it uh, hasn't changed much from the far-off dry cow program. Uh, 100,000 of vitamin A, which is about twice the NRC guidelines. The vitamin D right at NRC at 20 or 30,000. And maintaining that good level of vitamin E at 1,000 added units. The new Ohio State data with very low selenium levels would indicate some benefits raising that number up to a higher level. And uh, that would be true if blood selenium levels would be deficient or very, very marginal. So be aware of this new data set that's out there. One has to understand the exact conditions your cows are under before you would bump this up because vitamin D is very, very expensive. This would probably cost you five to eight cents more per cow per day. Not a major cost, but would nearly triple your vitamin cost if you go up to this 4,000 level of vitamin E. Well, then let's look at some of the guidelines, some of the, the pet things on the phase two close-up dry cow program. Some of this is review. Some of this is just couched a little differently. Five to eight pounds of grain. Ideally, some of that grain should be similar to what the cow will see after calving. This is to get that rumen adjusted and also build energy density into the ration. The protein levels mentioned earlier, 15 to 16 percent, with some of that coming with from a UIP or undegradable intake source. We'd like to maintain five or eight pounds a long forage or hay in the diet to maintain rumen fill, rumen function, forage mat to keep us away from DAs and acidosis and off-feed problems. One technique to consider is feeding a third to half of the total ration dry matter coming from the high group TMR because the high group TMR will have the forages the cows will see after calving. They'll have some bypass protein, some added fats, some high quality forages, so it makes that transition a little bit easier. The downside is there may be some sodium bicarb in the high group TMR, which works against the anionic salts and the DCAD balance, although that effect is marginally small, and we'll discuss that a bit later in one of the next modules. I would recommend bringing an anionic salt or salts into the diet, especially if you can manage that in terms of dry matter intake, because it brings to us a metabolically safer ration to the cow. I would recommend adding yeast culture. We'll share that data with you in a minute. Six grams of niacin, especially in herds that have heavy dry cows or herds that have more problems with ketosis. And then using propylene glycol or calcium propionate as a source of energy and glucose for that cow right at calving to maintain higher levels of blood glucose. NIFAS is a term that is relatively new for many people. It stands for non esterified fatty acids. And the key bullet point is number two. If NIFAS in the blood are up, they come from fat reserves, resources. It doesn't come from fuzzy cottonseed. It doesn't come from megalac. It doesn't come from tallow. So if the cow has high NIFAS, she is telling you and I that she is mobilizing body fat. 
According to the Wisconsin and Michigan researchers, the normal levels of NEFAS is around 250, and that number will stay in that range there. If you look at the Wisconsin data, five days before calving to three days after calving, this number nearly triples. So it says these cows are getting in trouble before calving. They're mobilizing body fat. They are setting themselves up for ketosis and other metabolic problems. Then three days to a week after calving in healthy normal cows, this number will drop down to about 500. It doesn't drop to 250 because remember, these cows are negative energy balanced. So cows in the first two to four weeks after calving are mobilizing body fat, and that's why that number stays up still modestly high at 500. The problem is if she goes ketotic, that number will stay over 900, and we set ourselves up for some real problems. So again, this shows the NEFA profile from Rick Rummer's group there showing 20 days before calving, uh, 250 or 0.25 depending if you're expressing as millimolar or molars of NEFAs, just a terminology or where the decimal point is placed. 10 days before calving, this is slightly increasing at calving at sky high. The point on this slide says that if we're going to come in with propylene glycol or we're going to come in with niacin, you can see we can't wait until calving because at that point, some of these cows are in big trouble. So if you're going to go to this type of an aggressive program, don't wait too long. You may want to start at day four or five or six before calving before the cow gets herself into a problem. What will that problem look like? Well, we can see that if this high level of NEFAs develop, the liver will store this. Ideally, the cow uses it as an energy source, but the liver is the sentinel organ. It says, my job is to keep these blood lipids under control. And we'll see these liver lipid levels increasing greatly under these cows with high NEFAs. And this can happen within days. This doesn't take a month to occur. And you can see in these severe ketotic cows, these liver lipid levels can range all the way up to 15 or 20 percent, some of this which may be irreversible. This slide indicates the type of additives that your nutritionist or your consultant, your veterinarian, or you as a dairy producer may decide to add. So in review, we'll go through these very quickly. Uh, six grams of niacin prepartum. This will cost you about six cents to add this. A third of a pound of calcium propionate. There are several new products on the marketplace now that you can purchase. This, again, is a glucose precursor, as is one pound of propylene glycol. This is generally drenched to the cow to give a slugging effect to increase the insulin response to these cows. Again, starting both of these products uh, prepartum as well as the niacin. A half a pound of anionic salts would be added to get the decad you would like to have. Some of the newer salt type products based on hydrochloric acid or biochlor, you may be feeding two to four pounds. So the amount of this will vary depending on the source and type you're purchasing. And then 20 to 140 grams of yeast culture, again, depending on whose product and how concentrated it's going to be. So let's summarize this module again in terms of what are the take-home messages on the close-up dry cows. If I'm going to pick out five of them, here they are. Number one, make really sure you keep adequate levels of vitamin E. The new Ohio research clearly shows how important this is on mastitis and cow health. Number two, you may consider adding some organic trace minerals to the trace mineral package of the close-up dry cows so that they are more biologically effective on this cow. Thirdly, consider using some of the high group TMR to help us in transition. It also allows us to use that same mix a couple of different ways. Fourthly, I think the Canadian and Illinois data indicates that yeast culture may be a useful additive put in the feeding program. And fifthly, consider glucose precursors, especially if you're seeing this pre-calving ketosis and some of the fatty liver risk windows occurring out there on your herd. Well, that completes this module on the close-up dry cow program. Very critical to have this group of cows separated and develop a feeding strategy that meets both the cow, the unborn calf, and the immune system challenges. Thanks, and have a good day.